Patty Wexler is an investor in deep tech companies such as Commonwealth Fusion Systems, Every, and many more. She's a mother of three, Miami-based, and a proud Hispanic American. Here's a quick teaser for this episode. As I always say, it's not like the world had to be built on fossil fuels. We found what I consider to be an incredible disruptive technology 150 years ago, and it really was extraordinary. And because of that, we have the life we have now. But we also now need to recognize that we got to get ourselves as fast as we can away from it. We're going to take a deep dive into climate technology, investing, and creating a sustainable green economy of the future. If you like this type of content, please subscribe, like, and comment because every bit helps. Chapters and timestamps in this video as well. Let's stay curious, learn about Patty, climate tech, investing, and the next hundred years on this episode of the Learn With Lowell Show. What about Miami makes it ideal to be the climate hub for the 2020s, if not like the rest of the century, in, in your opinion? I've never been there. Yeah, well... First of all, it's a wonderful, fun place to live. So you want to be somewhere that you can attract people. But I think there are four reasons why Miami should be a climate hub, in addition to other places that are already interesting climate hubs, where there's interesting technology being developed and there is governmental concern. The first one is geographically. I think it's well localized to be a hub for the Western world. As we think through, this is a global problem, so we really need global solutions. But given the geopolitical realities of the world right now, it feels like the Western world will develop kind of an alliance and we need um, big, large scale solutions. So being on the East Coast time zone gives you access to all of the US as well as uh, Europe and Latin America. And it's like an interesting landscape. So Geographically, I think it's a really interesting place. The second kind of obvious reason is that um, Florida being a coastal low laying region is going to feel effects of climate change sooner rather than later as many other places. We've been having much more flooding, much more hurricanes. If heat uh, days increase, certainly here, there's already quite a bit of heat days. So there's certainly motivation and to the extent that some of the climate solutions are also about mitigation and resiliency, we're already doing things here. If you call them climate related or not, we've been improving on levees and building stilts and building codes are strengthening. So, you know, there's already activity there here in terms of dealing with that. Um, I One third very important point is that as you think about where the emissions need to be stopped. Right now, most of them are and have been in the Western world. But as you roll forward the clock, the per capita emissions in um, the first world, let's say, are already tapering off. But in growing economies where populations are growing faster and where standards of living are growing faster, that's where um, emissions are going to grow really fast. And if you look at the next biggest cities in the world, they're primarily in climates that are closer to Miami's climate than they are to some of the leading cities of the world with cold climate. So this is an excellent test bed to roll out in kind of first world economy and economics solutions that will serve well in buildings and industries that are in places that have high solar energy and you know a high number of heat days and that it is in the heat where we consume most of our energy as opposed to in heating homes in the cold. And then finally, I would say this is a perhaps contrarian view. Uh, people sometimes feel that because um, the state of Florida has not been as progressive as others in Um, supporting climate policies and supporting climate investment, that that's a detriment. But I actually feel that being a purple state and a big state gives us an opportunity to lead the charge. We need to do a good job, those of us that really care about climate, to make it less partisan and less uh, morality point and just get everyone to understand that it's good business and it's good science and that we don't need to Um, be us versus them on this issue. And so I think Florida has, um, you know, an opportunity to to be that. You know, there's a company called Next Era Energy, which is the largest renewables generator utility in the world. It's about an hour north of here in Florida. And um, 
you know, they are incredibly forward thinking on renewables. And I don't think it's a political stance or it's a moral stance. It's simply good business sense. And I think with that pragmatism, we're going to get a lot more done and we really need it. Mm -hmm. So would Miami be like, in addition to what you're saying, like, it it sounds like it'll be kind of like the tip of the spear, but with the, uh, my concern is like with the raising water, you probably wouldn't want to develop like in terms of like building them, you probably like build it in the Midwest and then like uh, implement it in Florida, like these different systems and stuff. So it doesn't get affected by the different water erosion things going on. Or do you see it all happening there, like around it as, as a, to test, like how to, how to mitigate, how to like develop and mitigate it at the same time, if, if that makes sense. Like, how do you see it? Like, right. I mean, yeah. If, if I understand your question, you, we're not erecting like, like a building that will solve climate change. We're just like developing solutions, you know, mm-hmm. solar panels and, and new heating processes and new production. And so, those ideally will be all over the world, close to where population centers are. What I think you can build locally in Florida, obviously will be levees and, you know, figure out what are better building methods that result in, you know, dealing with climate change, at least as it relates to flooding, hurricanes and high temperatures here. But when I say, um, you know, where you're going to put various factories and various production, that's a very, you know, Florida has a highly developed space industry. So if there's things related to that, it could be here, a highly developed tourism and transportation industry, so logistics and shipping. But yes, if you were going to do, you know, a car factory, you might develop interesting things here and put them in Detroit or or anywhere that you think that there's industry opportunities. That makes sense. Then, um, like after Miami, is there, it would like the next city in terms of like it's built in Miami it then we have like units of scale has been broken it's had its teeth cut what where would be the next city you see it i mean we, you talked about like there's a lot that fit within the category of Miami but like for people in the US who are sometimes like geographically uh ignorant of like what's outside of our borders what would be some of the other cities that would be uh, comparable to Miami that would uh feel the effects of all this R&D going into Miami well let me actually take one step back and and i think we'll maybe cover this later but to me, climate is a uh, an issue that permeates almost every sector of the economy and every city, every place in the world needs to be incorporating the concepts of sustainability into how they think about anything. So when I say making Miami a climate hub, I don't mean taking away or making it somehow something shocking in the U.S. where Miami takes disproportionate share. I mean, Miami establishing itself as another very important bastion of uh, developing sustainable industries, nurturing sustainable industries and building its future. Miami has been incredibly lucky in the, um, you know, in the pandemic, which was so devastating to so many people around the world um, over the last few years, there was a silver lining to a few places and cities that had uh, the benefit of having an influx of new populations and, and establishing growth and having lower unemployment than other places. And so to capitalize on that going forward, I think uh, Miami can say we're going to build a thriving economy on leaning into sustainability. So I think, you know, San Francisco, Boston, New York, Denver, all the places that are doing interesting things should keep on doing them. But Miami should absolutely be another important hub. And around the world, cities like Miami, I mean, I can't think of any important city in the world in which policies aren't being thoughtfully implemented and everybody plays to their strengths. Um, so, you know, if you're in Amsterdam and they've been historically developing levies and, and, you know, that's a core competency that they're leaning into. If you're in a shipping industry, you're working, you know, in improving that and greening and in new emerging cities in third world markets, they're working, you know, in Africa and Egypt, there's huge investments into solar as well as in Spain. So, you know, everybody assesses what their strengths are and leans into that to build a, uh, you know, a green economy. That makes sense. The, um. So you've identified the area, and I, one thing that I think is interesting is when someone is kind of not saying the same thing, but like, uh, like, like kind of going in the same direction for for multiple years versus like they change a lot, which is good too, depending on like if you're like it's good to take a date and like change. And I think like you've been talking about Miami as a great place 
to be in terms of tech. Like, uh, originally, when we uh, first spoke, like I think like five years ago, um, you were the first VC to go from the Bay Area to, or one of the first, I don't know, there's probably like other people on the walls that we don't know about, uh, that to go from like the Bay Area to uh, Miami. So uh, my question is, now that you've identified the area and the, the, the sectors that are interesting to you, how do you, and I'm just kind of wondering from your point of view, if, like I were you, how would I go about going around like, do I go to Amsterdam to see how they do levies? Do I, uh, and then talk to the nerdy uh, R&D scientists that are living with that type of problem so that then they are more on the cutting edge. Um, so uh, like reverse engineering, how you go about reverse engineering and seeing opportunity is really the question. Um, do you, is that, is, is it a component of like traveling and then applying? Is it uh, reading a lot of journal publications? Is it, I imagine talking to a lot of really nerdy people, um, but how do you find these opportunities to apply to Miami to then know that you're going to deploy your capital or other people's capital effectively and it's not going to be wasted? Got it. Um, excellent question. So um, to, to answer the end, but then go back to the beginning, I don't um, have a strategy to deploy capital exclusively or even primarily in Miami and Florida. I think that this can be a hub for various activities and what I do, which is invest, has always been um, global or at least Western world in nature. And so um, what I'm saying is that in the way that people have always accepted that you could do you know, software investing in San Francisco or in Boston and a few other hubs were beneficial, I think for climate tech, as different hubs establish themselves, I think Miami is an extraordinarily good one. So... Um, I will still plan to invest globally. And I think, um, you know, perhaps if I look historically recently, probably uh, 50%, maybe a little bit north of that has been in the U.S. generally. Um, and only some of it has been, you know, anecdotally in Florida. Um, I don't personally need to be co-located directly with my investments, generally speaking. Now, as to where to allocate capital, it really depends where in the stack you play, right? Like some businesses are very local. And so if you're doing, um, there's a giant company a half hour away from me that is one of the leaders in HVAC installation and distribution for all of the US, but very dominant in the Southeast. And they're looking very locally. If you're a utility, obviously that's very geographically decide, you know, you can't serve a cluster outside of your area. Um, but if you are an early stage investor, which is what I do, I've always looked for opportunities um, connecting with hubs of talent, uh, hubs of investment and hubs of development. And I, my personal uh, way of investing is very thesis driven. So top down, I start with what's the problem? What are the biggest levers that exist in order to solve that problem? And they're pretty varied, right? It can be from food to energy to um, ag to industrials. And then um, what I bring to that as a perspective is that I'm very bullish on the green economy taking us to a better place as opposed to being this um constraint that we need to put upon ourselves to survive. I think, you know, the, the image of we're never going to eat steak again. We're never going to travel on planes. We're going to like, you know, light a candle and, you know, only do like the absolute necessary and maybe be colder in the winter and hotter in the summer. Um, the longer we procrastinate, the more we will have to go through that. Um, but the, 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 what I see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is that we have built an extraordinary economy based on sustainable energy. So not only did the emissions problem get mitigated, but we ended up in a world with clean, endless, limitless, clean energy. And that changes a lot of things about the way we produce things, the way we think about, because um, I always give the example of uh, you know, when I was in my teens and cell phones started becoming a thing, it was like, I have this many minutes and, you know, I'll only talk to you if I really like you and I won't pick up the phone if you're not important. Or, you know, we had long distance calls and we would run to be like, say happy birthday quick, it's somebody else's turn. And of course, now that's kind of meaningless to a 10 year old kid. 
And I think that's where we will get with energy and it'll unlock all sorts of business models and opportunities, not to mention, of course, we'll have less pollution and less noise and all sorts of things with cleaner energy. So um, to circle that back, I like to look across the world and what are solutions that are going to improve the environment, but also unlock just huge economic value. And so the business is self-sustaining because the dis- it just generates a, a lot of economic and societal surplus. Yeah. Um, another thing that I think uh, may or may not be a part of like what, what you enjoy about the, the sector is that um, like the 1900s were about centralizing things. So like we had them like even monopolies to the point in oil and gas and all these different areas, uh, which allowed us to some think win World War One and World War Two, um, just like the econo- the economies of scale we could do and be, do it cheaper than other people. Uh, now, uh, a lot of the technology is decentralized. The power grids are right, right down the road. The food's right down the road. A lot of these things um, have shorter supply changes. So if we have, you know, like the Bronze Age collapse type situation where like there's a lot of chaos going on at the same time, it doesn't cause a ripple effect of everything else going down as well. Um, that's one of the things that I like. And um, I imagine you enjoy as well is like the, the robustness of the system. The, by developing these technologies, we actually become more stable even if like an asteroid hits or like any of these like you know hurricanes yeah. or whatever happens like i've always pictured like for instance like cell like being really great is like put it in a super tanker and then if there's like a hurricane that hits so you can park that right off the coast and then you provide food for everyone in, in the local area um that's in addition like just the energy levels as well if it's coming from the sun like is you know you don't really have to move to find the sun especially if you're in a place like miami like the sun's gonna find you uh no matter what you do um but i think that's one of the one of like the the things that I'm seeing right now um, that a lot of people are talking about is like the fact that things are going to be decentralized and uh, more robust, um, but still integrated with the rest of the uh, world's economy. So like we can be uh, still com- uh, competing with other people and whatnot. But uh, at the same time, when things go bad or we have like a pandemic or whatever, um, the supply chain and, you know, getting people food so they don't starve and stuff like that, um, or getting energy so they don't uh, overheat uh in the summers which i as we we're talking before gets pretty intense in miami i don't know how phoenix arizona exists uh, apparently like it can like melt people uh during the day but um <laughs> to, to, when um is it is it all hopeful in terms of like how you think of the future in terms of climate che- uh climate tech or is there an element of like i don't know how big of a history nerd you are i think you are if i remember memory service but like yeah is it is there are you not okay well there uh no, I, or is there okay yeah all right um uh do you, do, you, do you also think like bad things happen in the past and uh, if we don't do these things like um, they'll happen again or is it all uh, more like there are bad things but like focusing on the optimistic side of developing them puts us in a better position if that makes sense like I know it can't be quite dichotomous so like I think that might be like missing the point but I'm curious like which one do you tend to focus on as you think on things like is it the negative rumination like if we don't do these things we're going to have worse problems for our, our kids or is it, if we don't do these things we'll have less opportunity for our kids which is kind of the same thing but yeah, um, it is slightly different. different. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think my nature is uh, more optimistic. I also think it's pretty much impossible to be a venture capitalist and not be an optimist. It's like it's part of the job description to believe a founder that is telling you something, uh, you know, pretty different. You know, you 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 know you 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 succeed when you're both right and contrarian. And so there has to be something really that people can't wrap their arms around and it happens to be right. And you're betting on somebody building something massive and exciting. So I think if I had to pick, of course, it's a mix of both um, and carrot and stick are always the incentives. But yes, I think I'm more um, motivated by, by viewing the world. I think it's also just both a personality trait and a, uh, a defense mechanism. Like I was recently having lunch with a mentor of mine who is maybe uh, 20 plus years, uh, my elder, and he's at the end, he's at the beginning of his retirement and he's a lot more negative. Um, And I think like, you know, we were having lunch and I kept trying to like steer him to a more optimistic view of the climate challenge. And at the end he said, you know, actually, you know, keep your optimism. Like, I, I think, he can afford to be negative. Like what, how are we, when we have 60 years in front of us going to be, you know, enjoy life and and build something. If we don't have a hopeful outlook, even if you realize 
that it's not a certain outlook. You know, if somebody told me, would you bet your family on that the lives of your children are definitely going to be better than your own? Or I, I don't think I'm ready to guarantee that, but I feel like there's at least 50% enough that, you know, you want to keep swimming to get to the other side of the bridge. And so it's inspiring to think about how great can that be? Um, so, so I think it's both, but my nature is, is more optimistic. I also think that nothing is going to change by my nature, except that a positive nature will, you know, give you more motivation to, to push forward, to get right things. I think as a society, we gain nothing by being just, you know, pessimistic. Um, and then back to your original point about resiliency and uh, more localized supply chains, for sure, that's very, very interesting. It's a huge trend. It's certainly in climate, it's very big because when you calculate the carbon footprint of moving things around, it's kind of unnecessary. And so it's much easier to live within circular ecosystems when, when people are around. But even if you leave climate aside, it's just kind of a, a mega trend of the world. So this is happening across every sector of the economy from, you know, satellites, you know, rocket ships were big, now they're mini, to, you know, steel mills. We went for scale, 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 and now mini mills are the big thing. And part of it is we've realized that while there are economies of scale, there's a minimum efficient scale for most things, after which the benefit is relatively minor, but you start having diseconomies of scale, right? So like if something breaks in one machine that produces a million tons of steel a year and um, for a week that thing can't work, you've lost 100% of your production. But if the gap between the 250K uh, applies and the 1 million was only you know, a 2% efficiency difference, you'd probably be better off having four of those because that way when you do have a stoppage, it's actually only stopping one of the four instead of all three. And so in many, many sectors of the economy, we've realized that the cost benefit of scale and subscale, there's an optimal. And so almost everything that I look at now in industrial applications is containerized and standardized and uh, to whatever the like minimum efficient scale is. It doesn't always apply, but it often applies. That's interesting. Yeah, I've never heard uh, anyone talk about that. That it's usually just like build, build bigger. You know, it's like the McMansion of the, I feel like the McMansions of the, a lot of uh, American entrepreneurs is like, if I just build, build a bigger factory, it'll be uh, even better and more efficient. Um, uh, but is something I always wonder when we're, we're talking, and I think I ask this to uh, every time, but um, which is, uh, I guess it's kind of like the insanity thing, like to, does it change or whatnot? But I, it seems like you're very much like the person who sets the conditions for people to be successful within that has the big impact for other people. Um, I'm curious, like, what about that? I mean, I think the, the, the diverse nature of all the different things that you can hit, instead of being like a, a startup founder working on one thing, you have like so many different arenas of areas to, to play in. Is that the thing that, so I think like competency, like what people choose to do comes down to like, is it, is it fun? Do they have an aptitude for it? And is it rewarding? And so I'm kind of, uh, trying to ascertain like, what, what is it about being an investor over, uh, like a nonprofit leader or, a uh, an yeah. entrepreneur leader uh, that just like keeps coming, like has you coming back to it for so for so long. Yeah, like you're not bored of it. It doesn't seem that way. No, I completely love it. And uh, I mean, first, I probably will dispute the premise originally. Like, I I don't make so much things happen as I uh, do my very very best to find the incredible founders that make things happen, and then I just kind of sit there in the sidelines and like you know get the glow and just the uh, you know try to share lessons and, and and advice as I can um, so that they can reach their potential. But really, you know, the investor's job in the spectrum of comparison is nothing like the founder's journey of taking like literally nothing and building something incredible and with the roller coaster in between. Um, you know, as a, in building my own investment practice, I've had, you know, a tad of the experience of what a founder goes through and it's really impressive and, and theirs is much more challenging. But in terms of for me, and, and, and you're exactly right, like I totally love what I do. And I was lucky enough to fairly quickly figure out that that was 
what I was good at, what I enjoyed doing and what I could uh, make money at. And you look back and it all like makes sense, but life is a series of like different journeys. And I think I could have ended up in other places as well. But um, so, so I, I had a lot of academic aptitude growing up and I knew that I liked kind of like intellectual analytical challenges. So that kind of set me up originally. And then in my first roles where I did corporate strategy and investment banking and worked a little bit in, in, a, in a company and in a startup, all those experiences led me to realize that I was really good at high level strategy at like, you know, seeing something and very rapidly digging into it, understanding like the landscape, the important variables, what levers to move that I enjoyed that. I always was like a crazy reader and, and I just love to, to learn. And so it kind of like suits my, Oh, I get to do this as my actual job, which I would do in my free time. Um, and that, I also realized, you know, when you look at your strengths and your weaknesses, like I didn't think that I was particularly good at managing people, managing big teams of people. Some people really love being leaders and having like dozens or hundreds of direct reports and organizing staff meetings and like developing. And I didn't think that that was my forte or my passion. And so it didn't make sense for me to go down a path of becoming kind of a CEO. It was much better for me, kind of like a strategy person or a M&A person. And then when I kind of stumbled on investing, it was the final piece that put it together because what was always lacking in these side roles for me was that um, you weren't putting your money where your mouth was. So you'd either leave a PowerPoint with your client or you'd recommend a transaction and move on. And it had, for me, it needed more closure. And with an investment, now you are making decisions and you're going to see through the result of those decisions. And in the process, you get to interact with people that I find incredible, that are these founders. And so that was general investing. And I spent a big chunk of my career doing consumer tech, which was super fun. You know, I was close to the action when Facebook happened, when Yelp happened, when, you know, so, so that was a interesting time to see the rise of new titans and be very close to excellent investors and excellent founders and excellent companies. But, um, and I think I must have talked about this the last time we spoke, but um, when I was in Silicon Valley, I had just had my third child and I was, um, I don't know, thinking more deeply perhaps about what it was that was the purpose of what I was doing. At that time, I saw that the more interesting new generation of founders had um, bigger aspirations, wanted to really leave a positive dent in the world. We're looking at people like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk and what they were building as kind of more impactful than just apps. Um, and that technology was really advancing so fast that the cost of data processing, the cost of storage, the cost of uh, genomic sequencing, all those things were coming together to enable just a whole new world at the time that the climate challenge was also kind of becoming more um, uh, predominant in the circles of uh, government and industry and society where we realized, wow, I guess we really, it's time to really pay attention to, um, to this issue before it's too late. And as I always say, it's not like, the world had to be built on fossil fuels. We found what I consider to be an incredible disruptive technology 150 years ago, and it really was extraordinary. And because of that, we have the life we have now. So I think we should be appreciative for what we were able to get from fossil fuels, but we also now need to recognize that we gotta get ourselves as fast as we can away from it, ideally without compromising our standards of living. And so, um, the great thing is there are technologies now. Many of them need R&D, some are early stage, some need to be deployed at large scale, but we built, you know, some, someone found, you know, black tar in the ground less than 200 years ago, and we have trillions of infrastructure today for that. Now we have synthetic biology, we have solar energy, we have wind energy, we have, um, you know, uh, tons of software that can help us improve energy storage we have the tools in place to do that again. And so that can be the driving force of our economy for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. 
I think uh, sometimes when people talk about leaders, I picture like a Toastmaster where like everyone like has to talk or whatever. But before it's there's like, just like a bunch of guys and they're all pretending like they're all it's like they're all trying to be leaders. So they just like sit there talking over each other. And so then people think like when people think of a leader, it's like George Washington at the end of a, uh, you know, uh, a boat like leading people or just like talking very loud. Actually, I think there's so many different types of leaders. And so um, I, I still like there's the end of like in this case, a, a very strong analytical strategy leader. And so I know we wanted to get on this topic of how do, how can you how can you innovate through a recession or an economic downturn if you're a startup founder and you're hearing all these reports and you're seeing all these firings going on, uh, which is a great opportunity to hire people. Uh, but uh, like how how is now like a, how how should they navigate this time? Are there yeah. opportunities such as like a reduced cost in labor to build more things? Is that like an op- something they should be thinking about versus just like cutting costs in all ways? Um, like, how would you suggest it for yeah. the for the people you work with in this sector to navigate like uh, all this doom and gloom that seems to be talked about in terms um, of like a potential recession? Right. Um, so you know, I'm in my mid forties, and that in tech, especially recently, could sometimes feel really old and out of touch. Um, but it turns out that um, in these times it's actually a real positive because i've lived through some of these already and especially as a venezuelan i've seen a lot of economic uncertainty and so you know the world won't end this isn't the end of all the plans startups won't all disappear um but and so i'll give you a bunch of thoughts but first of all is almost any economic equilibrium you can figure out and work in. What's very, very painful is the transition, right? So if you started a company or raised money under one set of assumptions, getting from there to the new one is treacherous. And I do think that the um, default rate of companies will increase quite a bit. Like if you, a ton is luck, you know, a ton is, did I raise exactly at the right time or did I time it to raise at the worst time? And did I hire? Some of it is some sectors of the economy will be favored and some will be less favored. But the the best advice I can say is this is temporary and you just have to swim to the new normal. Things will adjust themselves in the new normal in a new way. So, you know, people lived through an economy that had double digit interest rates for decades and the economy grew. And if we go back to that, there's a new normal or that works. What's very, very painful is to have, you know, bought a stock assuming 0% interest rate, now have to sell it assuming 6% interest rate. Yes, you probably won't have done very well. And that applies to sort of, so um, one is, uh, you know, hold on tight. It's a, it's a transition. There will be a new normal where you can reinvent, number one. Obviously you have to look at your own business and see, is my business well suited for a new reality? If you are particularly focused on the most discretionary of spend at this particular point in time in a category that has been overfunded, that's less exciting. Perhaps you might wanna explore more opportunities to pivot than if you are in the ideal trends of the time. It's very case by case. I would say you were talking about recruiting, which certainly is helpful. It's much more profound than that. It's that the people that you are employed with are everyone is recalibrating to what is sufficient what makes you happy what's a good number do i need to have three offers in the back of my mind and that's going to get you just more satisfied better culture employees your competitors are going to decrease to the ones that needs to stay in the game right so if you were Let's say you were a very rational ROI focused founder, but your three direct competitors had each raised a hundred million dollars and were overpaying for everything. And to stay in the game, you were forced mm-hmm. also to hike up your salaries, pay more CPM on Google, whatever your business required. As the um, marketplace clears between the real founders that were committed and the ones that were kind of in a get rich quick scheme, or just have less stamina to stay in for the long haul, your business will be 
uh, better suited to win, right? Like you'll have less irrational competitors, the pricing, not only of talent, but of everything um, will grow. And, um, and then I think people will be focused on, 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 on the right things and not expect you to, uh, you know, double your valuation and grow your revenue at 5X. I think, especially with some of the more kind of scandalous news that is coming up recently, I think everyone is coming back to, did we really need to expect that, you know, startups and VCs needed to mark up by like 2X every 12 months and go back? Like that was somewhere in the back of our minds. I think we all knew that it was unsustainable. And now it's finally like sinking into everyone that of course it's unsustainable. And so we can go back to the right amount of expectations for, you know, what a business needs to deliver to be a fabulous business in the long term, right? Like I, this is mixing a little bit apples and oranges, but um, when I started investing in what I invested, part of the driver was VCs had become, I thought, a little complacent in saying, oh, I'm only going to do SaaS and I'm only going to invest in hard software that has 85% margins and CapEx is too hard and this business needs too much capital. But if you look at the incredible successes of our time, like Tesla or Apple or, uh, you know, companies that really struggled, Amazon was unprofitable for so long. And, you know, uh, Bezos had like a really clear conviction of what he needed to do with distribution centers and service and inventory to get to the promised land. And, um, and I think maybe we will all go back to saying like, you know, it's not like we want to invest in high capex businesses, but we understand that we won't get to the, you know, future perfect that we want if we shy away from also investing in real things that take a little longer to materialize. Um, so, uh, I, I, I meandered, but hopefully I answered the question. No, I think you answered it really well. It's a, it's a time for people with vision and the discipline to see it through. Right. Uh, and, before and by the way, was... maybe just to, to finish it off, it's, this doesn't mean that you don't have to make tough decisions to weather the storm that if you used to think in, if you're a fun, you know, if you're an early stage startup and you were raising in 18 month cycles, you probably need to raise in 24 cycles. And I've been through many restructurings in my prior life. And I can tell you, no one has ever said, God, I cut too much. Really. It, it's painful, but because if you need to cut, this many millions of, you know, you need to cut $1 million out of your burn and you cut, that's either one year of like 1 million of salaries or in six months, you know, 2 million. And so the longer you procrastinate and the insufficiently deep you make the cuts, you're just making that worse for yourself. So um, you do have to, you know, make the tough decisions of, what will it take for me to survive to get to the other side when I can find a new balance? Mm -hmm. I think of it like, uh, I, I agree with you. And I, I think of it like preventative medicine versus triage. You don't want to be in the situation where you have to triage. It's better to do the preventative things like exercise, dieting, you know, simple things like brushing your teeth uh, so that you don't have problems that require you to get a root canal or whatever is going on in your life. Um, Cause that sucks. And it, you know, it'd be worse than if you just did the little things in the uh, short term. Like uh, one thing that I found that a lot of people don't do is if they're going to do a raise in like eight months, they don't talk to any VCs in the end term. It's like you don't you don't want to go find out like who's a good person to talk to or not. Like they want to get to know you. And if they don't, then, you know, it kind of, you know, whatever. But like you, you can spend like a little bit of time now um, building the thing, like the relationships for like a, a raise you're going to do later as one example, um, as it fits into like your diet of what you're doing day to day to manage your, your, your um, the business. I think that sometimes people think it's like, I have to do a lot of something or a little of something, but I think we're talking like preventative medicine of doing the right, like a little bit of the right things over the long term and making the hard decisions as soon as possible. Another thing that I think that a lot of people uh, mess up is they, they like, when they have to fire someone, they like really let that person labor a lot of times. Like I've seen so many people that are like, oh, I don't know, they're trying. It's like, you know, they know it's not the right fit and you know it's not the right fit, but they're sitting there trying their best and it's just like they're their best isn't here, it's somewhere else. And like, you're just getting in the way of them doing that. Um, and then you find in the candidate that will do uh, well for them. So um, I definitely 100% agree. And I do not think you meandered. I think you answered the question really, really well. Um, I, I and think one it's other, like just- um, thing that I was gonna say is, you know, one wonderful thing that's happened in tech and in venture as a result is 
you know, with the explosive growth, um, there's been a ton of um, a democratization, right? Like a lot more people have come in, a lot more entrepreneurs. Um, as a result, also a lot more venture investors. And that's all actually really, really healthy. One thing that's happened is also educational content has really exploded, right? Like, you know, this podcast is one example, but there's tons of podcasts, there's tons of videos, there's, and that's incredible. But if you look at like, because so much content has increasingly been generated, it really skews towards the last, um, you know, 12 to 24 months of expertise. And when people are like, I want to talk to somebody who succeeded and there are people who succeeded in the last two, three years, they're speaking about a very punctual moment in the market and how you raise, how you communicate with investors, how you has had quite a bit of cockiness embedded and a lot of, I would say, uh, founder leaning um, policies and styles. And, and so I think, Everyone, it behooves them to kind of like open up the arc of history and realize, you know, if you read, there's a book that came out this year that I believe was called Secrets of Sand Hill Road or, or something about venture. It's really good. It covers the history of venture. And um, they talk about a lot of the seminal venture capitalists and deals and investments. And the numbers are like adorable in this context, like, you know. $2 million for 20% of the company. And it was like, you know, Apple or electronic arts, but mm -hmm. people had just different expectations. That was, you know, 50 years ago, but there's somewhere in the middle between what happened in the last 12 months. And if a founder was like, oh yeah, I call everyone and I have a week and I open a data room and I don't take seven meetings. That's not how it usually is, right? Whereas usually a lead investor really wants to spend a little bit more time and learn a little bit more and get more questions answered. So totally to your point, uh, you probably need to start even sooner than you would have six months ago. Why does it seem that some VCs are like really allergic or seem to really be against climate change or climate technology? Like they, it, it's not like they turn their nose up at it, but it seems like they're like standoffish on it. And it, not even in terms of like it not being in their sector of technology or deep technology that they're interested in. Like it's definitely within their wheelhouse, but within that wheelhouse, this is like the redheaded cousin sometimes when I'm reading the forums or reading people's blog posts, they don't really, they'll have like a, a ton of deep tech and it's like all oh, this climate change stuff. Put it to the side. So um, have you have you noticed that as well? And then what do you think is causing that? Yeah. If so. Um, I mean, it's it's changing rapidly, but I think the original, um, there was obviously kind of the pain of climate 1.0, where it seemed, you know, some of the best, like Kleiner Perkins was the bluest of blue chip uh, VCs at the time. And, and they lost tons and tons of money, although apparently it seems like it wasn't as bad now that companies are coming back. But um, so I think there was scar tissue in the same way that between Internet 1.0 and Web 2.0, there was also some pain, although that was much shorter lived. Um, but I think it was broader than that. I think climate overall seemed, you know, not an inspiring technology that people could rally around, but like bandaging a problem and that wasn't what excited technologists second um it is typically involving hardware or hard tech or engineering and because in the last 15 years there was so much money to be made in communications and software and SaaS products that it felt like why am i going to like get my hands dirty with something complicated that has long cycles when I can do asset light investment and cut my losses quickly if it doesn't work and make, you know, tons and tons of money if it does work. And so um, that was a secondary factor. I think also, um, you know, it does require more domain expertise of different kinds of advisors. Like, you know, when people invest in productivity or consumer tech or how people buy things, how people order cars, how people order food. It's like, you know, obviously we're all experienced users of those categories. So those categories attract everybody. Um, when you need to specialize, and obviously there've been a small pocket of VCs that have specialized, you need specialists. And so, you know, who actually had uh, expertise or the desire to build up that expertise when there were all these other big, easy categories was not very much. There was a, I think, misconception that these asset light mo models didn't ultimately also require a ton of CapEx. Like, you know, the, the 
Ubers of the world, you know, you can maybe build a prototype and be very profitable at high margins in the first city, but to protect their position, they had to throw billions of dollars in successive rounds to corner more markets and protect more things and build up the marketing. And so maybe they didn't put it into CapEx and they diluted themselves at, oh, but that one is discretionary, but it wasn't discretionary because if you stopped it, somebody else would take over the leadership. So I think there was a um, overweighting of how capital intensive it is to build businesses that have things, but the other ones are so easy to replicate that you have to invest a lot of money in building a moat. Um, and, um, and then I think the final thing, which again is kind of coming to, to a nice closure now is that relatively speaking, climate successes seemed really slow. You know, you have a technology, it takes a while to do risk, then you have to do a pilot, then you have to grow it, then you have to buy customers. Meanwhile, these overnight successes, I mean, crypto being maybe the most, you know, extreme sexy version of it, were really, really quick. Like companies were founded and like two years later had tens of millions of users and billion dollar valuations. And so relatively speaking, it did seem like a less interesting use. I think now that people are doing the math on, capital invested value companies that they thought that had exited at great prices in a SPAC or an IPO. So unless you timed the market and like sold your position in the last, you know, 12 months, the ratios are starting to go come back to being kind of more historical norms of what a success looks like. And so now um, real companies that are building real things are relatively better positioned. And then finally, you know, in the defense of all venture, like, you know, venture is backing what they think is the next big trend of our, of our time. And I think more and more people are coming to realize, wow, between societal demands, scientific consensus, governmental incentives, you know, the math is working in a way that it's never worked before. Hmm. Is there, um, so you're not, uh, you don't have a PhD, but I don't ever thought that like a PhD stops anyone from learning. How do you go about, and like my process is like if I'm learning, if I'm trying to learn about like a specific subject, I like, uh, I'll ask the people just getting into it. Like, what are the things that you're experiencing? Then I'll ask people doing it. And then I'll ask people who have done it like some, and then I like kind of like mold the question slightly different. So by the end of it, I have a very clear idea of like what it takes to do whatever it is I'm looking at doing. Um, but how do you go from, yeah. uh, you know, interest to be knowledgeable enough to do what you're doing? Yeah. Like what do you, what are your, like the things to learn? How do you, basically it's like a meta, how do you learn? Yeah. Question. So I mean, it's super helpful that I was an engineer and um, then I, my first kind of small roles were in a cement company and industrial businesses to get a little bit of a grounding in kind of engineering analytical thought and be able to, to process some of the more complicated stuff. But I will say I am definitely at the low end of the spectrum in terms of scientific expertise on most of these topics. And I, I think it's it's okay to invest that way so long as you're extraordinarily aware of that. So, you know, there's some famous graph where you first know nothing, then you think you really know a lot, and then you realize you know nothing before you become an expert. And so I try to make sure that I'm not at that local high where my initial learning, which is, you know, reading everything I can get my hands on, seeking out experts, building out, you know, technical advisors that help me analyze opportunities and think through the issues and, and get more than one so I can have counterbalancing opinions and then marry that with the theory um, that, you know, I'm very lucky that I happen to just love to read. And so all these topics I find like enormously fascinating. So it's, it's like a good thing for me to fall down a rabbit hole. And that as a venture capitalist, you're actually like in a really good position to get experts and other smart people to collaborate with you because there's an economic incentive and an interesting opportunity to get that done. Plus just spending years in the ecosystem, you start learning a little bit more. Um, but I'm always aware that there's much, much more than I don't know that I know. And I'm not making an investment decision on, is this formula better than this other formula? I'm relying on 
Is this the right founder to figure out the formula? Are experts believing that this is a viable approach to solving the problem? Is that, you know, so, so it's a multifactorial equation in which deep scientific understanding is not critical to my decision. It's important that I able to validate the scientific expertise and understanding of the team and that their approach is viable more than me sitting there and being like, well, let me compare your, you know, uh, symbio approach and if what your core ingredients are to his and I'm going to make that decision. Um, so, you know, when I invested in Commonwealth Fusion, which is a nuclear fusion startup, so, uh, you know, it would take me decades to probably begin to understand the inner workings of the tokamak. But it was understanding what the experts were saying, contrasting around the experts, speaking to the team, understanding the expertise of the team, seeing their vision and my investor judgment on can this team execute and what is the upside of success and what is the downside of failure more than like, can I crack, you know, how to get this done? So I, I think the most important thing when you're wading into um, very technical depths, especially in early stage, is to understand that you don't know. And frankly, if I knew as much as I need to know, I shouldn't be an investor because you can't be across multiple categories and invest at the bleeding age. So if I were one of the world's foremost experts in nuclear fusion, I should not be wasting my time doing this. I should just be doing nuclear fusion. Um, so it's almost, you know, I've never intended to hire on my team the experts that help me analyze. I'd rather have them be in their sources of expertise in academia or in business and collaborate because they would get stale sitting in a small VC firm looking to pick what are like the three, you know, nuclear or whatever their sector is of expertise investment would be. That makes sense. The It sounds like it's a very analytical approach to like triangulating truth versus like maybe it's like some obviously seems like this very like gut. They meet someone and they shake a hand and it's like, that's good. I kind of picture people in giant uh, 10 gallon hats in Texas doing that. Um, and so I like the idea that, uh, there's like a like a very analytical way to yes. I'm sure there's like a, le a level of like gut. Like no, of course, just, like, there's there's investment judgment and intuition and gut about the founder. But yes, there are people who are incubators or are, uh, you know, pre pre-seed investors or angels that say, I love having like an entrepreneur walk into my office and talk to me. And most of the time I back them. I even know that whatever they're telling me is not even going to be the, the thing they're going to figure it out. And that is an incredible skill. And the people who've done it well, you know, I'm, I'm very in awe of. That's not my skill. Like, um, I, of course, it's all about the founder always. And, you know, if you could only pick one thing, it would be the founder. But my way of assessing a founder requires hearing him or her articulate the problem and how they've come around to solving it and how they're going to build a team and what they've done so far. And through that, I can get a sense if that's a founder that I believe can take it to the next level um, versus, you know, people who are like, you know, I met this person in a bar and I thought they were great. And they turned out to be, you know, whoever is on the cover of Forbes magazine in a decade. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it has the added benefit of like you're finding people that people wouldn't find. And then when you do find them, you can assess them more accurately. And I don't, I think like earlier you were saying, like you kind of sit on the sides and you bask in the the glory of like the startups but I, I i imagine as well like you're a part of helping them if like a startup's having a problem if, if you've experienced that before you're going to be the person who's like hey here's some ideas on that um so then you can more tailor your your vast knowledge to what they're going through as well which is extremely valuable as well well for sure uh, i mean 100 percent. i mean uh again i'm more like a traffic cop than anything but you're a founder you're very heads down in your own world and you probably haven't done it more than once or twice if you're a investor you're you know an inch deep but a mile wide and you've seen it so many times and so um that's a hugely important perspective and um you know when i speak to some of my founders and today i was just speaking to one um that i led his uh seed round a couple of years ago and uh, he was very kindly telling me some things about exactly that, which is he's going through fundraising decisions and how to approach different investors. And he comes to me and, you know, the reason I know is not because I'm smarter than him. It's because he's done it two times and I've seen this playbook 200 times. So I can give him just a little bit more 
uh, comps on what the market is accepting and what, and I, I have more ideas because I've seen more things been tried. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So I am going to transition us to some personal questions and then right. uh, lead on with some books. Um, so, uh, so to give you some uh, preface, basically, um, I'm asking you like what happiness means to you for a long time. I thought everyone had like somewhat of a uniform experience. Like in the Western world, there's like what happiness means versus like the Eastern world. I'm sure like it's entirely different. But uh, I recently, like last six months, learned that like people perceive what happiness is differently. And it's like I've been approximating it in other ways. But I think it's a very interesting question. So like how do you, what, what does like happiness mean to you? And then how do you know when you've achieved it or uh, are experiencing it? Yeah, that's a great question. Very meta and philosophical. I think, um, you know, different cultures, different people and different life stages be different, right? Like I think probably in my twenties, I would have thought of happiness differently than I think now. And I also think it's one of these privileges of living in this extraordinarily wealthy society where we have a lot of time to think through this stuff, which actually sometimes makes us unhappy, but, but gives us a lot of bandwidth to think about what is actually happiness. And I would say that in my from the moment that I started my career until not too long ago, maybe until five years ago or so, achievement and progress and getting to more success. And obviously from a personal standpoint, finding my partner and building a family, like building. Building was the um, the driving force of happiness. You know, obviously you're having fun, you're making friends, but really like the the big happiness was building towards whatever I imagined was my perfect life of stellar career and stellar family and stellar whatever it was. And then as you, if you're lucky and you achieve many of those goals and, and you don't have, thank God, like, you know, big uh, deviations with any health crises or otherwise, then you start going, you know, further, like what will marginally make me more happy? And I think um, if you ask me now, it's being at peace with yourself. It's feeling like what you're doing is stimulating for yourself, for people around you and for the world so that, you know, I feel really good about what I do. Um, as you're building a family that is, it takes such a big chunk out of your like emotional well-being or not, you know, like, you know, having mm -hmm. children, building a family and, um, and so I would say happiness is finding that inner peace between having, you know, building a life that you're proud of and you're enjoying. And from a career perspective, I feel very happy doing something that, you know, I come home and sit at the dinner table with my kids and I try to explain what I'm doing and they totally get it. And it's interesting and good, or at least my definition mm -hmm. of good. Are, are they like your kids, your family? Are they who you picture benefiting from your work in terms of, I think that a lot of times people say, I want to save a billion lives. Like that's, it sounds nice, especially when you're talking to investors and have, like telling a vision. Mm -hmm. But I think that people always picture someone like I want to help Sam who has this problem, who is a, a part of this group of a, a billion people. So when you're, when you're investing in this technology and you're looking at these sectors, are is it your family you're thinking of or, or is it a nebulous like better? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more than one thing. I think, you know, something very specific with my family is um, I have two daughters I have three kids, two, two of them are daughters. I find it particularly inspiring for them to see, you know, a mom that was there for them, but also achieved and didn't, you know, didn't stop just to raise them, but was able to do both and do something big and important. Um, obviously, I want my family to feel proud of me. But when I think about that great future, um, I do think of it really holistically. You know, I think it's uh, just good for the world. And, you know, as you said, reading history, like it's really interesting to see, you know, the world advanced at like a snail's pace of uh, what we today would see as misery. It probably wasn't misery, but it was a very hard life for 99.9% .9 of people. Um, literally like kings showered once a year, you know, a few hundred years ago. And then in the last 200 years, it was the most transformative time. And if we want to continue doing that, we have to really unlock new technologies and 
wean off of fossil fuels. And so that broad thing is really exciting to me for everyone. Hmm. Makes sense. Then um, do you do you encourage them to do you think they're going to follow in your footsteps in terms of being like a VC technical type analytical person? Or do you think they're going to be pioneers and other like a doctor or something? Yeah. So one thing you notice, you said you're from a big family. I have three kids. It's three different worlds. Um, mm-hmm. And it's really hard to know. And I, um, I, I really don't know. I, I joke as of now, but they're very young that um, my daughter might be a lawyer and my son might be a, you know, he, I think he could be a great like investor. Um, he's really grasped some of the things I say. And my daughter has these incredible arguments. The little one who's seven, um, it, world domination, but I don't know how, but you will control <laughs> the world. Mm-hmm. It, it would be a, it sounds like you have the makings of a family office then. The, exactly. Can, yes. We will all run ourselves ragged together. Yeah. The world domination one would be like the seat, like the president or something. Exactly. You gotta like During give them the like pandemic, something to do. I, we got a pandemic puppy because that's what you did. Yeah. And I wrote an investment memo, um, like a joke about getting the puppy, which by the way, of all the things I write about business and about it, that's the thing that's the most been read ever that I ever wrote. And uh, in that memo, I clarified that the, you know, the driving force and the executive chairman of the business was going to be my youngest, but she was clearly stating like, I'm going to be a hands-off chairman. I'm calling the shots, but you guys are doing all the work. Um, so, so yeah, that's her personality. Sweet. And then, uh, what books are you currently reading? Um, wow. So I'm always, first of all, I only read one book at a time. Um, but I, I read a lot of books. I just read a wonderful book, Andy Dunn's biography. He was the founder of, uh, Bonobos. I think it's pronounced the, the pants. And he Hmm. had a very, um, interesting journey and really, tells the story of his mental health challenges. And I, I haven't had anyone with mental health issues as close in my life. And he, he just painted a very vivid picture that I thought should be required reading. First of all, I couldn't put it down, but also required reading for anyone in like the 21st century to, to, to see it and to accept it in your surroundings and just see how other people handled it. Um, that was great. Um, I just read recently also, What We Owe the Future, which was really interesting timing, considering that it was part of this effective altruism movement that is just in the news now because of the FBTX uh, debacle. And um, I really had a a big aversion to it even before the debacle. So I was glad to to see that it validated all my my instincts. But it's an interesting premise. It's a fun book to read because it feels like a good book club debate about you know, should we value future lives more than not? And it's a very philosophical, analytical approach to it. Um, But uh, in the end, I find the theory kind of uh, useless to really make constructive decisions going forward. Hmm. I haven't uh, heard of either of them, so I'm going to check them both out, which is great. You you always recommend books that I haven't haven't heard, which is awesome, uh, uh, because if you could see the opposite side of this camera, it's just a wall of books. And there's only the ones that I like that I buy another copy of to like mark up. Well, I publish uh, so- every year um, all the books that I read, which I started like mm. five or six years ago. This year will probably be like, I might hit my goal of book a week. I'm not sure. So it'll be 52. Um, I think my favorite book that I read this year is called The World for Sale. And it was written by yeah. two FT reporters who write really well. And it's the it sounds incredibly dry. It's the history of commodities and commodities trading, but actually it should be turned into a series on Showtime. And it's really interesting history, very timely, but also just really engaging reading because the characters that built up that industry are extraordinary personalities. Yeah. Uh, you recommended that to me like a month ago. I bought it and it's going to be the book. I'm like literally looking at it. It's the next book. All right, I'm good. Tell me so how really you read it if you agree. Now I feel like I've overly set the standard so high. That's not a good way to start reading. No, it's all good. All right. It's not like uh, apparently with comedians, if you if you introduce them as like the, the greatest comedian, like it's only downhill from there. But with books, it's all fun. Okay. I uh, all right, good. I separate. Yeah, I'll have fun regardless of what, um, what you said. Is there a skill or a subset of the climate uh, arena that you're trying to learn right now? They need help learning, uh, either an expert or or a skill-based thing. I don't know if you want to learn juggling. (laughs) 
Um, I'm always looking at new topics to deep dive in. I am currently spending tons and tons of time on grid optimization. So um, basically, you know, if we're heading to a world in which we're going to electrify everything, the demands on our grid are going to explode. And so, of course, we need more grid, but also we should be more cognizant to eke out maximum utilization. So one very simple example that everyone always gives is because midnight hours are lower cost to charge, everybody could set their EV to charge at midnight, but it would be really dumb for everyone to be charging at 12. And if you divide it into 12, one, two, and three, then you would have a quarter of the demand in each hour. Multiply that by like 1,000 inputs and outputs into the grid. I mean, it used to be that the grid had one coal plant fed into the power station and distributed. Now there are, you know, 50 inputs into every plant, and then there's hundreds of outputs. And so there's software and different techniques. So I'm spending a lot of time on that. And another topic I'm spending time on is hydrogen, which I had looked at a long time ago. I had kind of concluded that it was too long of a time frame for that to win within an investment period. But as technology advances, as the IRA and, and more people get excited about it, I'm thinking it deserves a revisit to see if I change my mind. So I still haven't, but I'm looking into that. But there's always something because, as I said, climate is going to touch everything. So, you know, you could go down a rabbit hole on lots and lots of issues. Is the So, like, if there's a person out there with like a really interesting take on hydrogen, uh, I, I imagine it's an energy source. The um, is it the best way to write like a medium post and then like send it to you? Like, what would be the best way to like help you for like? A, 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 I don't want to have like a hundred people requesting a meeting with you. So no, no, no. But would if that you be, like, find somebody way? that you think this person would be really great, just email me and tell me. You know, I think you should talk to so and so, and I'd be delighted to. If so, they have right, and then, documents uh, and books and posts, I'm also happy to read them. But yeah, oh, well, I think it is, if you're going to meet with someone, you should write it out anyway. And if you can write it out anyway, you should just post it and then uh, and at the same time, uh, post it and then say one deliberately wrong thing. So you guarantee people say something. That's interesting. Yeah, I think it's called, uh, it's like Murphy. There's like, there's a, a rule on this where you deliberately, like if you say something wrong, someone will comment. But if it's all right, people will ignore it. Um, so a lot of times you, I, I will do that sometimes just for fun. And That's you will always get a response, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, some people, some people will do, will make a post and then they'll, like log in with another account. I don't do this because I think it's silly. The log in with another account and say like a, a, a wrong take on what the post was just to like have like a couple hundred people come in and like and argue it back and forth, which is kind of funny. Uh, well, the, all those but, tricks uh, are super interesting because my posts are read by almost no one. <laughs> I was joke that like I write for my husband. So I probably should learn a little bit about all these techniques. I've read all your posts. I read them when I, they come out too. I like them. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you, uh, there's like a, I always see like a bunch of people that I know reading them too, or at least I assume based on the fact that they make, they like, they comment on it. They do? It okay, assumes. good, good. If they're commenting, that's good. If they're commenting, yeah, I think Arturo, sharing, that makes me very happy. Yeah, I, I, well, it's more like com like they, when they share it on LinkedIn, they say their thoughts and it usually is like, they need to know something about it other than just like the topic that you said it was to know about it. Like Arturo the excellent guy, the guy who makes yep. eggs. He's always like, he's loving it, your, your content. Yeah, he's great. Um, yeah. Uh, but okay. So then, uh, you, you're moving around a lot. Is there, have you made like a new website? Excuse me. Basically, what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're working on? Is it medium posts? Is it LinkedIn? Is it, uh, probably like medium. Feed? I mean, I, I'll have a website up and running soon, but it'll be incredibly minimalist. So it's not going to be very helpful, but it'll probably have a link to my medium. <laughs> So that's probably mm -hmm. the best. And, and when I publish something, I usually do try to tweet it and put it on, on LinkedIn if it's work-related. So Twitter is also a really good place to, to follow me. Even, even with Elon at the wheel? Are you enjoying that? <laughs> with that? I'm just going to wait and see what happens. Cause I think yeah, it should work out. Real, I mean, if I were his advisor, I would say, look, there's probably nicer ways to achieve the same stuff you're doing. Like, you know, I, I don't even disagree necessarily with what he's doing. It's the way he's doing it that I think is unnecessarily brusque. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm certainly not going to second guess the guy that, you know, created Tesla, SpaceX and, and PayPal and say that he doesn't know how to uh, fix big structural problems. So I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. 
Um, I feel sad that he's, you know, hurting so many people in the process in a way that I think is unnecessary, but maybe he feels it's necessary. Yeah. Um, there's a, a person, an individual who, uh, when they were firing everybody and the, the, he keeps doing it to people, to, to CNN reporters, they'll show up and then they're like watching everyone come out. He pretends to be an employee that it was oh, is laid it off. Figma guy, Rahul Figma. It's because uh, I think so. He has he has like very brown hair, and he said he'll say like I need to get back to my husband and wife uh, right now at the end because he just like he's just saying stuff to see if they'll listen. <laughs> he always gets them to go for like ten minutes. I don't know. I love the guy. I want to give him a podcast and just see That's what he's funny. up to. I don't know who that but, is. Uh, it's too hard to keep up with all the memes and drama. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, and then it, we talked about a variety of things. Um, is there anything we missed? Is there anything that uh, we didn't talk about that we definitely should in our closing time? That's a good question. I mean, we could probably keep talking about a ton of other topics, but I think you covered the basics of, um, you know, m maybe I'll say one thing. I don't know who's listening to this podcast, but if it's people who are kind of like figuring out what to do next and, and are open-minded or are early in their careers, I believe that um, we are in an, the future is going to be very different than the past. And right now, the world that we got used to of basically more or less global peace, more or less zero interest rates, and a stable economy where the US was pretty much the obvious sole superpower, is coming to an end and the new reality will just be very, very different. And um, I think the era of excesses of get rich quick um, is also coming to an end. And so if you're starting your career and figuring out what to do, there's nothing I think better to bet on than to say, we're going to rebuild a hundred trillion dollar economy and it has to be done sustainably. And we have to build really big businesses that matter. So if you're going to like pour your heart and soul and energy into something, might as well put it into something that you think will stand the test of time and make a big difference if it works. So anyway, I think that uh, working on those big problems is, is you know, it's the best bet you could make. I don't know what the outcome will be, but um, you have a much higher likelihood of success and personal satisfaction doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's... um. It's rewarding versus doing like a drudgery job that maybe you take because you have loans. Like you should manage your finances, but at the same time, like usually if you're doing like the really cool thing that you're excited for, you're going to obsess over it and you're going to know something that other people don't know. And uh, usually the market rewards you. Right. And, and then the other you know, thing is maybe tying or, or building on what you just said is um, everything can be done sustainably or not, right? Like, you know, Tesla has a marketing person and, you know, Exxon has a marketing person. And, um, you know, of course, if you happen to be a synthetic biologist or a nuclear physicist, you know where you're going. But if you're, you know, more open-minded and you're like, you know, a VC, you could go invest in, um, you know, gaming apps or you could go invest in new technologies if you're, uh, you know, a marketing person, if you're a writer. So I just think like, you know, find something you're passionate about and, focus on that. And if you don't know what your passion is, you might as well fish in a place where it's something really big and important for the world. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, and for people who are not sure if they're passionate about something, I recommend they read out, read the book, uh, Franklin by Walter Isaacson and copy what Franklin's dad did for him to figure out what, uh, Ben Franklin liked, which is basically just expose yourself to a ton of stuff. Like uh, this podcast, we talked to so many different people. Exactly. By the way, I, right. I had said earlier something in case anybody was really paying attention, but the book that I meant uh, that talked about the history of VC, it's called The Power Law. I think I referenced another. Oh, okay. So anyway, The Power Law by Sebastian Malaby is a really good like intro to history of VC and makes a really good case for why VC is really important. So self-servingly, it's a good book. Thank you for joining us today with the Learn With Lowell show. Check us out at learnwithlowell.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found, subscribe, tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. That's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.